This is Startup Storefront. Hollywood does not treat all filmmakers equally. Despite being a critically acclaimed director, Fanny Grande found it extremely difficult to find funding for her new movies. The major studios saw Latino movies as a niche market with very little broad appeal. That's why Fanny and her husband, Nelson Grande, founded Avenida Productions, a movie studio in the heart of LA. They're providing equal opportunity to filmmakers to fund, film, and distribute their next big hit. In this episode, we spoke with both Nelson and Fanny Grande about why crowdfunding campaigns fail, why Fanny is the top crowdfunding coach for creatives across the country, and why they created their own streaming service. And thank you to Cat Footwear for sponsoring this episode. They're a premier shoe company that empowers builders and doers to reframe the world to create something more meaningful. And on that note, grab your popcorn and please take a seat. The movie will begin shortly. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to the founders of Avenida Productions. Thank you guys for joining. Either one of you can take this. Explain a little bit about the company. Thanks what do you guys do? Us. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> we are a non-traditional movie studio, and our mission is to democratize access to Hollywood, specifically for underrepresented communities. Mm-hmm. And the way that we do that is by providing solutions for funding, production, and distribution. What made you aware of the problem that you're trying to solve? Were you guys in Hollywood? Were you trying to become actors yourselves? What was the thing where you were like, okay, this is a real problem? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, both Nelson and I are actors. We started acting. I actually grew up in Venezuela. I've been acting my whole life. Were you born in Venezuela? I was born in the U.S., but I okay. grew up in Venezuela. Okay. Acting I'm from Peru. Life. I was born in Peru. Oh, yay. Yeah. South America. <laughs> <laughs> so when I moved to the U.S., my par- you know, the situation in Venezuela was getting really bad. So yeah. my parents are like, we're out of here. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So we went to the U.S. and I was so excited because it was going to be closer to Hollywood, you know? Where right. Did you come right paid. to California or were you? I moved to Denver, Colorado to okay. go to university. So closer to Hollywood, but not quite. Yeah, well, yes. to me, it was like yeah. the Progress. same country. I didn't realize how big it was. <laughs> we moved to Massachusetts and I, I still don't know why. Yes. But <laughs> so we ended up in Denver, which by itself was a huge culture shock from the Caribbean to there. Sure. But when I was in college, I wouldn't get cast in any of the college plays. And I'd be like, why? I don't understand. Even like the like local stuff. Just, yeah. So okay. the dean of the college pretty much said, well, you know, people are not going to. She literally said, people are not going to believe you can play these roles because I'm a Latina. You should go to the Latino theater company in town. I was like, wait. I'm paying you to educate me like I cannot, that, yeah. you know, understand. That's so backwards. Yeah, it's backwards. So, you know, I did join the Latino Theater Company in town, and I met a community of people that, you know, felt excluded. I did have one professor in college that said, listen, you have to just write your own stuff. So when I was in college, I started writing plays, and then I wrote my first f- short film. Well, as soon as I graduated, I moved to L.A., and obviously the – the issues that I was facing in LA were a lot bigger here, right? Every Latino actor and creator that I met, writers, directors were facing discrimination when it came to Hollywood. And the few roles that were available or are still available are usually negative stereotypes, you know? And I'm like, I don't want my community represented this way, especially because I come from Latin America, like we have lawyers and teachers, and right. you know we're all Latinos. Yeah. Like, what? Right. You mean you don't import them from the U.S.? No, no, we have them. So wow. I was like, wow. wait, I'm pretty sure we have them That's in this funny. country too, and obviously we do, right? Yeah. Latinos yeah. are Yeah, it's not like spine. California's view of a Latino. Like, exactly. it's, there's a lot of diversity in what that means. Yeah. Exactly, but not in media, and it's right. you know to this day, if you turn on the TV, we're usually the criminals or something right. like that, the or, or something. the props. So yeah, yeah. exactly. I decided to keep creating films and to cast my friends. Actually, I cast Nelson in one of them. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> one of the first films you watched like, 15, 16 years ago. More like 20, but sure. <laughs> All right. So that's how we met. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I kept making these short films and winning awards in like major festivals like South by Southwest, but I still could not get representation as an actor so or as a by, filmmaker. you won South by Southwest. Yes. And then and st- I still and no one was still, no! I mean, people Nobody should be cares. lining up to. That's, that's what I'm saying. You think so? <laughs> when you wonder why or when you ask them why, are they honest with you or are they kind of like, look, you're, I don't even, the way I, I don't even know if they're like, maybe you're just a niche product, niche market. And it's That's just what not they big think enough. of it. Like we're niche. We only speak Spanish. You know, we're 20% of the population. Sure, like yeah. we've been here forever. We're not just new immigrants. And even new immigrants eventually want to see themselves represented, you know? So I, 
a lot of people say, well, it's because you got to, you have to film your first feature length film. That's why you're not getting ahead. I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. The time I was a single mom. So the the solution is make a movie? Yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm like, oh my God. There's always one more step. Yeah, there's always one more step. Oh, that's that's what they would say. So I'm like, okay. Okay. So I wrote a feature film and then I started pitching it to studios, production companies, et cetera, et cetera, with my resume of all these awards and, and they're like, well, it's in, why is it in English? Why is it not set in East L.A.? These are the things people actually told me. Wow. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, my God, are you serious? I was like, we're speaking English right now. Like, <laughs> we're a huge portion of the population. We don't all fit in East L.A. <laughs> like, I want to tell a story about an American family that just happens to be a Latino family, you know? So I just could not get it greenlit. So I heard of something called crowdfunding. I didn't know what that was at the time. This was 10 years ago. So I went to the community and I said, okay, everybody, I'm going to make a movie that's going to represent us in a positive light. No stereotypes, right? So a lot of people from across the country gave me a little bit of money. And it was awesome because I raised enough money to How make the film. How much did you film. raise? It wasn't that much. It was about 50K, yeah. right? To make a feature film, that's a feature that's a because that's all I... Shoestring budget. That is, oh, yeah. Yeah. That is, yeah. Well, I had to have more fundraisers after that. But sure. the beautiful thing about this process was that I, I actually filmed it in Texas in a border town. And people had seen the crowdfunding campaign on Facebook and social media. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people showed up. So I didn't have to pay for one extra. I didn't have to pay for any locations. That helps a lot. My picture car. So that money went really... Somebody even said, hey... I have a crop duster. This is before drones. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so they showed up on set with their crop duster Hang your cameraman in the back, the back of their truck. <laughs> That's literally what wow. happened. <laughs> and my, my DP was like, okay. So he flew and I had aerial shots in my first feature, which was unheard of back then, you know? And the movie came out really beautiful because it was a, a labor of love. What's the name the of the movie? It's called go Homebound. 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 You can still watch it. Okay? Yeah. But then nobody will buy it. Like there's no distribution. They were like, well, there's no celebrities. I'm like, okay, I can't afford, we have two, J-Lo and Sofia Vergara. They're not going to do my movie. Like, I'm trying to make celebrities. So I went back to the community because I, by this time, so many people were invested in this movie, right? I went back to the community and I said, okay, this is the situation. So people started requesting the film at their local movie theater. No, it was really beautiful. Really nice grassroots movie. Yes. So I, you know, I toured the whole country and that's how I finally sold the film. I sold it to two companies actually. And it's still going strong. Like the movie's still going eight years later. And, you know, other filmmakers started seeing what I was doing. And they're like, how'd you do that? You know, especially Latino filmmakers, right? So I started sort of like help. At the time, I was part of the board for Nosotros, which is the oldest nonprofit for Latino Hollywood. And it was founded by Ricardo Montalban. So I had access to so many filmmakers. And so I was sort of helping them with their projects as a hobby, kind of. <laughs> because I had, you know, had to work. I had two kids. I was doing my own thing. And at the time, Nelson and I, even though we've known each other for a very long time, he saw me coaching people and helping people raise all this money. And he was like, babe. What are you doing? This is a business. Yeah, I saw, <laughs> I saw how she was hustling, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, there's a lot of money moving through this here. I was like, we need to capture this. And it's, you know, it's a combination of a perfect business, but on top of that, doing something that's helpful and aligned with the passion of what she's been doing for several years. So, you know, we kicked off immediately. And he came from business. So yeah. I, I was like, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want to charge people because this is like a social service I'm doing. And he's like, you don't understand. You can have it both. You don't have to have five jobs. And do that. You can actually have a business with a social cause. And, you know, because that's where he comes from. So he brought all that. And because I trusted his experience, I was like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was great because we started off and within a month, I had already quit my job. Okay. Like what, the, what were you doing before this? So we were both actually. I mean, we have many, many different have, jobs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Primary jobs, you know, as an artist, you know, you have a million different jobs, yeah. Yeah. but we were actually both working for a, a mutual friend and colleague as director's reps for directors for commercials. Okay. So that's actually where we learned that we work well together. Yeah. 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 And, uh, that was actually pretty, pretty vital in our relationship overall. And then once you realize like you could monetize, like what is the first step in doing that? And so is it just setting up an entity and then like taking a fee? Yeah. So what we started off with was because, you know, the biggest need is funding for, yeah. any, you know, there are a million, million, million great, amazing stories and, you know, 
projects out there on paper. Yeah. But without the funding, none of it goes anywhere. Yeah. So crowdfunding was our biggest oh, uh, first service. To date, we've raised millions and millions of dollars for I don't know how many hundreds of projects now. And is it is it on Kickstarter? Like, what do you? Yeah, we yeah. started using other people's platforms, but as now of you built your own. February, we launched our own. Oh, nice. congratulations! Yeah. What's yeah. it called? At South by Southwest, we launched it. It's called Support Our Story. And is it just Latinos, or is it? Have you guys branched out? What's it's the, for anybody? Any, okay. But most, I will say, most people that use it are members of un, from underrepresented communities. We're all about diversity and inclusion. That is our niche. That's our fight. That's what we thrive. And we're very proud of this platform because we just launched. We already raised close to half a million dollars for for projects. The success rate is 96% compared to the other platforms. And what we did was, you know, because I was coaching people how to crowdfund, we sort of took that knowledge and we put it into the platform. So as people are crowdfunding, they get coaching sent to them every single day, telling them what actions to take. Yeah, but on the, their crowdfunding. On, yeah, on their yeah. actual crowdfunding. Because it's platform. a real hustle. Well, yes. A lot of people don't <laughs> realize hard, that it's, it's not just like put it out there and let let like the social media do the work. It's like you need to be front you and center. You actually have to campaign. That's why it's called yeah. campaign. And, and yeah. that's the thing behind it. The number one reason crowdfunding campaigns fail is because of lack of information and guidance. On top of that, there's an abundance of information online because there's different several types of crowdfunding. You have equity crowdfunding and then you have product crowdfunding and then medical bills and all of these other things. But when what we do is we focus specifically on artists and artists crowdfunding, which is for rewards based crowdfunding, you know, which you don't get equity, you just get incentives is very, very different than any of the other types of campaigning. So when we focus specifically on the creators and we provide them with this coaching, it's, it's a game changer. We're raising what four times the amount of the competing yeah. platforms. And yeah. you think that's why, because you've sort of, Oh, we absolutely for the failure. Oh yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're looking at the data. We're looking at the data again this morning. We're always on top of it, looking at what's actually the driving force behind it. And it is the information. And we have anonymous, uh, feedback from our campaigning clients and it's all about the coaching. And so the what's the playbook that you've set up? Because like we've talked to a lot of founders who have maybe done a one-off crowdfunding and like that takes a lot of effort, but for, for you both having done this so many times and specifically for artists, is there like a set playbook that you go by and that you coach them through? Like, okay, you've got to feature this in your video. You've got to do this amount of posts about it. Like, you know, yeah. talk us through that. You know, I'm, I'm the top crowdfunding coach for creatives in the country. So I sort of just took every legend. Yes. Let's go. Yeah. I'd be kind of out of necessity, right? I didn't know this was going to be a skill. Yeah, sure. Yeah. We just gotten funded in the beginning. None of this would have been yeah, sometimes necessary. But like things don't work out so that yeah. you mm -hmm. can figure stuff out. So I did notice that certain things worked for everybody. Those are the things that we added to the platform. But that being said, we do have a lot of coaching in the platform that not everybody gets. So you're not going to get the same coaching as you are. Why not? Right? Why not? Because it's triggered by where you are in your campaign process. So some people are like, oh, they really planned it well and they raised, you know, 50% of their goal on the first day and then that's it. It stops, right? So the coaching for them is different than somebody who's doing it steadily and, you know, wins at the end. So we have the technology that we created triggers depending on where you are depending on your so every every journey. step that yeah you there, certain, there's several points of yeah. recognition you yeah. have to do with the you know a ton of different types That's of smart. metrics we That's also smart. have live coaches so a lot of times if people get stuck or they just want to talk to somebody they can actually talk to somebody for an hour 30 minutes yeah it makes a huge difference on their campaign the best one i've ever seen and you know just a small data point is this person kept raising 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 and they were like if i get to within 10 percent of my goal i'll wear like a bear costume. Yeah, we do a lot of that. <laughs> and so somebody, you know, and this was we years ago. We have them paint their, head, their face. Some people yeah. shave their heads. Not not women. Right, like, right. We oh, had sorry. a client that had shaved his beard for years. So it's like, I promise you, if you post that you're going to shave once you get to $20,000, people are going to give, especially your family. Boom, he got it. It's amazing like that kind of spectacle <laughs> works. Yeah. We're going to yeah. do that with Nick. We're going to shave his head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Nick, but you got to be podcast. like, yeah. you got to be, you got to be game. Yeah, you got to no be one. like, I'm going to do yeah. this. I'm going to have fun because people. It's the are, conviction that people respond exactly, to. Yeah. Exactly. And the mission yeah. of your project. Okay. What are you doing with this project? That's going to transform the way your community is portrayed at the end of the day. That's really what fuels people. So then once they have the money, they, let's say they meet the goal and then they're out to like make the movie. Yeah. 
what happens then? How, how are you guys involved so what, in <laughs> yeah. phase two of the yeah. pipeline here? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of our clients are like, I have all this money. What? I don't, I can't afford any place. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's why we've created our studio. That's you why know? you have your own studio. We have our studio, yeah. standing sets. And it's, it's close by, right? It's yeah, uh, it's, it's in downtown, just south of Echo Park. It's in, okay. it's, it's called, you know, Filipino town. So it's yeah. okay. on yeah. Beverly. Yeah. yeah. You know, I tell people it's next to the, it's close to the Tommy's out there, the original one. That's usually a landmark most people recognize. Yeah, if they're from LA, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So because, again, most of these communities and creators don't have access to these type of facilities, we wanted to incentivize and give them access to the place. So we put this place together. And the cool thing about it is that we thought of all the amenities. We have, you know, hair and makeup room, changing rooms, makeup stations, production office. We just had a dedicated fiber line brought in for, you know, remote directing if needed. Just we, we, we pretty much put together everything we wished we had. Yeah, you put it in there. We for put it in there for creators. Sets, we have equipment. So we have like a fake bodega, an apartment, cool. a restaurant, yeah. Yeah. a courthouse. You have a chapel too, right? Have a yeah. Chapel. Yeah. yeah, chapel. And a jail cell. People tell us, oh man, I could do my whole thing. Right. Here. Yeah, people start adjusting their stories around like exactly. what's everything that's there. It's great. That's it's cool right. because we've seen it dressed up in so many different ways already and people bring their own creative looks to it. Really cool. And it's just fun to see the different looks that, that the sets have. I'll say people walk into it and cry because yeah. they don't think they ha they have access to a place like that especially people of color you know lgbtq yeah. women like it's really like wow okay so our passion really is helping people's dreams come true and we're just doing what we can okay two things here right mm -hmm. so i'm a real estate developer in doing that i meet with entrepreneurs and, I, and to some extent i'm i'm like literally building their dreams yeah, yeah oh exactly. yeah there's a lot of pressure to doing that it's a lot you guys go to bed every night and you know that you're kind of responsible yeah. for people's, I mean, it's, it's on you. Yeah. yeah. But That's, that isn't pressure. that terrifying? <laughs> <laughs> it's a it yes and no, right? It, it is, it is, it's a yes and no because Listen, you're comfortable with business. It yeah, business, <laughs> we signed up for this. Listen, Hollywood's a tough industry, no matter what, no matter, yeah, sure. you know, what community or who you are, gender, however you identify, it's a tough yes. industry. Mm -hmm. On top of that, you know, being an entrepreneur in that industry is another thing. But I think that the reward has been just so astronomically fulfilling people who come to us are like i've been trying to make this movie for 10 years mm. and within one year of That's... contacting you guys my movie's on netflix or whatever yeah. you know yeah. so do you, do you guys help them with that too mm -hmm. so you if get they want yeah okay explain that part to me so once we have it made and we want to get it into distribution so you know how i told you like at the beginning people started requesting the my film at the local movie theater mm -hmm. well that platform that i used is no longer around, so we launched our own. <laughs> We're just like, oh, you need the solution, we got it. Yeah. So we have partnerships with movie theaters and filmmakers can do one-off screenings as long as they pre-sell enough tickets to cover the cost of the screening. Okay. Yeah. And then and how much? Is, how much is that? How much is the screening typically? Depending on the theater, sometimes a matter of selling, you know, sixty tickets, seventy tickets, okay. we'll cover the fee. And then on top of that, what we is that just, like two grand? Like. Well, it depends on Dep the region where on the nation. Yeah, if you're okay. going downtown LA or outside of LA or depending what other, whatever, you know, so city we're in. So 500 bucks, you know, but, okay. some, yeah. but here's obviously So it could be like 500 to 5,000. 500 yeah. to a couple grand is yeah. more okay. common. But it doesn't cost the filmmaker anything. They're just using their social media sure. and the coaching we give them. Yeah. And then by the end of the year, we're launching Avenida TV. Which is going to be... By the that. end of this year. By the end of this year. Wow. Yeah. Let's go. What is, is that a streaming Latino. platform? American it's Latino training. Network, yeah. Nice, congratulations. Yeah. And why? Is, it, because called, our is clients... that a fast channel, or what do they call those? Is that what that is? It's a streaming, like okay. Hulu, like one yeah. of those. Okay. Okay. okay, yeah, we've been so we're already approved on Apple TV, Amazon Fire, Roku, okay. iOS devices, and Android. And, and people listening, it's like an app they can just download. They can, yeah, no, yeah, so smart no. TV, boom, yes, wow, okay. It'll we're, be on your smart TV or on it your will computer. Be. It will be. How long has that been in the works? For a long time. I can imagine. Because all these projects that have been created over the six years, many of them have not been able to be sold the same experience that I had. Yeah. Because a lot of times, oh, where are your celebrities? Like, you can't afford a celebrity at this level, you know? Uh, or... Do you ever talk to the, the celebrities and, and, like, are they willing to have a conversation yes. and just say, like, look, play ball. Just, we don't oh, have yeah. the money, but, like... like, John Leguizamo is that client of ours. He's done yeah. two crowdfunding campaigns. So, like, the celebrities we do work with are the ones who want to tell their stories their own way they mm -hmm. want to like right. they want to eat well, with his like or... the the latin history for morons yeah, yeah i mean that was his story in, in yeah. a very unique way yeah and he did that i don't know if you saw the campaign phenomix it's like a comic book and that got picked up by a huge publisher and i think he's i think his goal is to turn that into like 
he wants like Latino superheroes out there, you know? Yeah. He goes to, so in San Diego, there's a, there's a place called Barrio Logan and in Barrio yeah. Logan, they do Comic-Con, but they do it their way. Uh, they Border call it Chicano X. Con at Border X. Yeah. yeah Border X. Yeah. That's, we that's where had we had their meet and greet. The meet and greet with John, <laughs> John. Yeah, 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 for, yeah, yeah. For the campaign. So we, we brought from. Border X to the city of Bell. I know. That's our development project. We love project. David so much. Yeah. That horchata beer is something else. It's really, really <laughs> And his wife has brujas. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's has, really yeah. cool. But that concept is, int- you know, it's, it's, so we, we went to an event where I, I met the, the, the founder of Comic-Con. And so he went through how he got started. And for him, it was really, it's a really crazy story to think about today. But the story basically is something to the effect of he was a weird kid, weird in quotes in that, in, in the society then where he wanted to dress up as his favorite superheroes. Mm-hmm. He connected with them, yeah. but he was weird. And then by putting himself out there in the world, he realized there was other quote unquote weird people like him. And and then he was like, let's all meet and be weird together. And this little seed turned into Comic-Con and it was really small at the beginning and then it grew and then Disney acquires Marvel and now Marvel movies are being made at a rapid clip with a lot of funding. And all of a sudden this turns into an empire. And for him, it was no more than just he just wanted to be weird with his friends that were also weird. That was it. <laughs> That's cool. And so when I think about Chicano Con, I'm like, here we are again. It's the same exact thing, right? It's people little by little by little getting donated comic books. And but why does Chicano Con exist? Because it's really hard for our creators to have a platform at yeah. Comic Con. Right. So it's on a response to, all right, we want to also participate. Yeah. The thing is, Latinos buy one in four movie tickets. We consume the most media. We are almost 20% of the population. We only get about 5% of roles, and they're mostly negative stereotypes. Behind the scenes, we get about 2% of roles. And what if we were the so, seventh largest economy? Yeah, if we were our own country, it would be the seventh largest economy in the world. So what we're doing is smart because there's a whole community that yeah. doesn't have representation, and we're going to fill that gap. Yeah. And that's what we're doing, you know? Even with beer, I remember, like, just, mm-hmm. just in this small way, right? So it's like we're bringing this Latino brewery to, yeah. to a 98% Latino community in Bell. And here's the coolest part for me. So it's like, that's cool enough. But the coolest part was then there was a kid who ended up working there as, like, a beer tender. It's a Latino kid. All of a sudden, he's like, oh, like, they're going to teach me how to make beer. I never even thought of that. And now he's literally, he works for George Lopez at his brewery as the master brewer. And it's like... You asked that kid five years before that brewery was there if he'd ever been in beer or ever been working at a bar. He'd been like, maybe I'll work at a bar as like a a, a bar back, but never like a master brewer, you know, it, and, and it changes life, changes kids' life. Creating opportunities in your community and showing that it's possible. It's just the exposure. Yeah. It just, it, it it's just the does exposure. A lot. We have oh, a yeah. lot of interns. So we have internship programs where we partner with local high schools and colleges, and we've had kids come through, and one of them decided, because, you know, we just build our sets and he was helping us with the props, like removing the labels and designing the labels and stuff mm-hmm. because you can't show Hollywood actual them. brands, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> right. he was like, this is what I'm going to do with my life. Oh, my gosh, wants to make, make I want to cry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah, for yeah, somebody yeah. to be like, this is it. This yeah. is it for me. Yeah, you know? they feel it's something, like, wow. yeah. And why shouldn't we? Like, it's such a right. large e- uh, industry yeah. that we should participate in. Especially too, here know? in L.A. when there's so many Latinos I mean, here. We're the majority. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. You got to try to keep us out, to keep us out. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a conscious decision and so then from your perspective just in terms of like getting distribution what's the hard part with the networks what are they you know not understanding what is the fight that you guys are always fighting you know number one i feel like they just don't value us number one because we're consuming so much already i feel like the mentality is like if it's not broke why fix it right what is it yeah what what did i say right so so in a perfect world you view it like the latino should vote with their eyeballs and by doing that they should only watch or they should really like be more aware, I guess, more of what they watch. Yeah. That's interesting. Does it help if every Latino on TV or the majority of Latino TVs is portrayed as the criminal? Like that's gonna affect how we're perceived as a community. But yeah. to me, most importantly, is our kids, right? If all you see on TV or the movies is somebody that looks like you, who's always committing a crime or something, you know, or who's not from this, or American, like, we're American too, you know, we're always the other, we're always portrayed as the other, so that is what we want to transform, that's what we're working to change, because it affects how our kids, what you just said, yeah, if you see it, you can be it, yeah, right? It's, it's a huge yeah. impact, I, and I'll give you a very vulnerable share from myself, I grew up wanting and trying as a kid to be 
white. Mm-hmm. Like to me, you know, within the culture, the Latino culture, a lot of it's like, be like the white people or things like that, the things that are said. So for a kid to feel like he isn't, to be aware yeah. that he isn't enough and he's considered an other yeah. is, I mean, it's traumatizing. I, yeah. I didn't get to actually understand the impact of it. I'm going to say to like my late twenties, you know, this, this is something that I've actually had to like undo in myself and realize that I had self-worth and that I was capable of doing things. And so to, to be able to give kids a different, a different, you know, just a different experience and it's already happening. Listen, it's starting to happen. I agree with that. I mean, same thing. I grew up, so we moved from Peru to Massachusetts and we moved into this neighborhood that was like a third, a third, a third. It was like the most diverse pl- place on the planet. Oh, wow. It was crazy. The mm-hmm. difference was all the Latinos that were Puerto Rican. And so yeah. people would be like, oh, you're Puerto Rican. Oh, yeah. And I was like, uh. Like but, in LA, we're all Mexican. Yeah, you're all Mexican. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm so a Mexican I'd, I'd here. Like, I don't care. What part right. of Mexico is that? <laughs> I bring so. them over to the globe because there's just no Google. So I go to the yeah. globe and I'd be like, I'm from right here, Peru. And they're like, oh, how'd you get here? You know, they're like blown away. <laughs> and I'm like, there's Puerto planes. Rico. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Puerto Rico's over here. Do you see how these things aren't the same? And But they didn't get it. And so I just got bucketed into this thing. But and I think then, media has a lot to do with that. Huh? Oh, a hundred percent. It's media, but it's also like at that time, you know, in the nineties, eighties, it's like stereo you just fall you the white people fall into stereotypes. People fall into stereotypes. And so we all do, yeah. For me it was like, Oh, he's Puerto Rican and then I wouldn't dress Puerto Rican <laughs> and so they'd be like, Oh, you're dressing like a white kid and I'm like so I'd go home to my mom being like, these people think I dress like a white kid. <laughs> I know white kids that are dressing like grunge and punk rock, so like what are they dressing like if I'm dressing like a white kid? And they're like, they're like, oh, they mean like you're preppy. And I'm like, I just wear what I wear. Yeah. And then I'd have to do this thing where I, it, what was weird to me is it was always like I never took it personal. I was always like, oh, that's interesting. Like it was mm-hmm. almost like an anthropological yeah. like third person. But, yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. I was like, I'd ask them. It made me curious. So I'd be like, oh, so how should I dress? And they're like, oh, your pants should be like more baggy. And I'm like, oh, OK. But like, but then, but why? Like, yeah. I was like, have you ever met a Peruvian? They're like, no. And I'm like, do you know how Peruvians dress? They're like, no. And I was like, they dress like me. <laughs> do you see the difference? And yeah. they're like, oh yeah. And I was like, yeah. And you know, you're all kids. So you're just saying dumb stuff all the time. You're all like learning on the fly. Yeah. But it was like, it was this weird thing. And I went to high school and then it was like, it was even more on display, you know? Cause in high school, everyone's yeah. finding their personality and all this stuff. And so now you're wearing like different sneakers and you're really like experimenting. And it was just, I just remember it being like, man, it's hard to fit in, right? It's hard to like, who are you really? Down to being told that we're not American. I don't know about you. If you grew up in Peru, right? To us, America is the continent. Yeah. Like, why are North Americans more Americans than South Americans? So I'm always like, wait, I don't understand. (laughs) You know? Because if you look at the history, like, Americo Vespucci never even made it to North America. You know? Like, isn't that big? But it's culture. It's all cultural. And you get to see the programming, though. It's really the programming of, like, TV. We talk about this, like, even with food, right? It's like, I've never seen fruit roll-ups and gushers in my life until (laughs) I went to first grade. And I'm sitting with all these five-year-olds around me. And everyone's opening their lunchbox. And I have, like, real food. And they have not real food. And I'm like... Where is, this, where is this coming from? Like, oh, and then you go home and you start watching like Nickelodeon or like Disney Channel. Saturday like, morning cartoons. Oh, yeah. look, at, look at all the programs. <laughs> and then you're asking your mom, can I have those things? <laughs> they were like crack. I'm like, these things are delicious. But yeah. at the same time, you're full like, of sugar. And right. <laughs> totally. Yeah. It's all. But you realize the programming. That's what I yeah. became a, very aware of. I was like, oh, yeah. it's the pro. It's what they're watching means what's in their lunchbox. Interesting. And then you yeah. realize brands on everything. Or like if you own the eyeballs, you own. You know, people think they have free free will, but. Uh, mm-hmm. No, not so much. <laughs> no. Well, we're just influenced. We're You're influenced. influenced. Yeah. And, you know, also, it's cultural constructs, right? You yeah. put somebody in a box because it makes you feel like, oh, okay, I can, I know how the world works. This yeah. is who, and we all do it. We do it too. You know, For everybody sure. does it. It's, I think I it's tell people, like, part Peruvians of are some of the most racist people you'll ever meet. And they're like, it's the same people. They're just different colors. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't make any sense. Yes. I think it comes down to just... I think culture, just, right? It's cultural, culture, and yeah. I, also, I also put some of it on human nature. Listen, everyone, totally, wants, yeah. everyone wants to feel validated and special, and what we do is we, we all clan up. We, we, you know, we, we, we find ourselves groups, yeah. and you try to find how your group is better than another group. And I think that all stems down to like insecurities. You know, a secure person really just doesn't care Certainly. about that stuff. So It's the ego you got to get rid of. Yeah. Yeah. 
for you guys, do you think anything's changing on the distribution side at all? Um, yeah, it, it, we're well, getting two it, seasons of stuff. I think what's happening <laughs> is the conversation is changing. The conversation is changing. Is the boardroom changing more women? No, so there's not no. enough of us in power, right? Yeah, the, the decision the, makers. Yeah, so there's still this, we're the other. That's still very prevalent. This is why we're doing what we're doing because our goal is that people will understand like, hey, we're just American as you are. We just have different and we're not a monolith, obviously. We're so different within our own community. So the issue is that there's so little content being created for the community that one one thing comes out, we expect it to represent everybody. Like you just ne- mentioned a, a show and you're like, oh, yeah. I don't know, it's not my cup of tea. It's like, I completely get it. Or gentrification, right. what was it called? Hentification. 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 Yeah. Hentification. Hentified. 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 I understand, but it's not meant for every Latino in this country to identify with it i had a there's a lot of people that were like oh my god this is the first time i ever saw myself for me when i saw one day at a time the remake (laughs) to me i was like oh this is like me this is how we talk because you know they're caribbean you know that's funny but because there's only one at a time like it's not gonna like mayans for example that's obviously not my culture at all (laughs) right right but (laughs) people love the show and it's only fifth season thank god and I, for me, my philosophy is like as Latinos, we just got to watch anything Latino just so that we can send us a, a right. strong signal to Hollywood. Hey, we want. And then yeah, there'll be advice. more more options because right now what's happening is like we get two shows. They're not get marketed properly. And after the first season, maybe the second, if we fight hard enough and, you know, yeah. they'll give us a second one and then it gets canceled. So, but also as an audience, as audiences, we have to support these creatives. The fact that Hentify got made is a freaking miracle. Cause I talked to the creator uh, a couple weeks ago and she was telling me, I was like, oh my goodness, a miracle that he even got made. So, but when he comes out, we're like, oh, that doesn't represent me. I'm not going to watch it. It's oh so yeah. But you, yeah. what did you say? But Nelson's like, oh, it doesn't represent you. But you watch Star Wars? What? Like you go to space? You're like a, <laughs> this, yeah. this, so while we're while you were talking about yeah. this, I I've and Nick, everyone will tell you I don't watch television or watch movies at all. I've never watched a Star Wars. Oh and my I've gosh! I've never watched any major movie. And I joined this tennis club where everyone there is like this Hollywood producer that mm-hmm. makes everything on TV, mm-hmm. and I'll like freely talk about my opinions on their shitty show. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm like you, yeah, I saw still, like five still, minutes, still with and, 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 and then they're like, oh, I wrote that, and I'm like. Yeah, it could have been better. I think uh, <laughs> spend more time next yeah. time. You know, at that point, you have to just own the joke. Right? Yeah, right. Right. Okay, whatever. But no this is the thing. Like, I don't now. watch any of this. And I'm maybe starting to consider maybe this is why. Maybe because that when I watch these things, like, I don't need people in these stormtrooper outfits. What's the point of that? Like, I'm not high. I'm not on acid. I don't understand. Like, it's I just called don't... entertainment. Yeah. I know. Fan, fan I know. the fantasy of it But all. the whole, like, for me, it's yeah. like I love documentaries love those yeah and, and it's probably why we have this podcast where we talk to real people about real things yeah well if it is a, a truly a volume game and i would imagine that you are somewhat constrained by how fast you can crowdfund and how like you know crowdfunding probably has a limit you're probably not going to raise 200 million dollars in crowdfunding so have you uh, either considered doing like an outside capital raise like a series a or something like that for avenida to you know you're coming out with this new app platform are you looking to expand the volume of shows that you can put out to be competitive with like a Netflix or other streaming service? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, we're never going to try to go after the same general market as Netflix is because sure. but what we are, we are going to be producing a lot of our in-house uh, studio productions. We also have partnerships with other creators who have shows existing on other platforms who are excited to come over to Avenida TV and have exclusivity there because it's more fitting. And on top of that, you know, we're working out deals with them. So, yeah, we are going to have original Avenida TV original programming on top of licensing a bunch of other. But when you're talking about capital race, so Latinos only get one percent of VC funding. And I've been telling everyone we're part of the one percent just to throw them off. But (laughs) yeah, but not that one percent. We're part of the one percent of the Latinos that receive funding. So even in that space, because, you know, we have a business, we we are to start up with a tech component and this is a whole new bowl game for us we have so we are in the middle of racing a seat round so thank you for asking uh, yeah. if anybody's <laughs> listening how much, are you raising? Plug. how much are you raising right now we're doing um on our seat now. round we have yeah. a million left we already have we already 600 have. that we raised and so who, who right now 
is like investing like are who are your capital partners yeah. are they mostly just like angels or latitude Latinos? ventures latitude ventures they are amazing latitude yeah, ventures. yeah they are our latino vc yeah yeah, yeah yeah they've just been the most amazing partners they get yeah. us yeah. they understand the need and they know the market you know they have partners that are funding that fund and they took a risk on us they're very happy with where we are and because media is something that impacts every industry it really is, believe it or not. I feel like Silicon Valley is a little bit more open to what we're doing because we're disrupting an industry and the people in that industry generally don't want to invest in what we're doing because it's I can like, say that. you know, but people in tech do see the value of it, you know? So that's kind of like the people we're talking to um, and individuals, individuals who are believing what we're doing. So are you raising as a platform? Worth all the, the, full, the, the, okay, full, so the, uh, the full ecosystem, yeah, okay. yeah, the and that's funding. one of the questions most people ask. They said, "Oh, well, that's the hard part." Yeah, because they, they want to know what they're investing in. They want that to be simple. The whole ecosystem. So at the end of the day, yeah. you're not investing in one movie right. because that's really risky. You're right. investing in this platform that allows people to. It's like tell an a index story. fund of mm -hmm. sorts. It's yeah. almost like an incubator, right? right but you're right. actually investing in a movie studio, right? So you yeah. have ownership of a little bit of a little bit of ownership of the whole system, but also like the content that's getting created, and that's what's exciting for for investors. And so it's very like unique what house. we're doing. Oh yeah, all of it. It's very unique. Is there a valuation or there's no valuation? Yes. Yeah. We're not going to tell you right here, but like, <laughs> do you want to invest? Because hey. I'll give you my deck this and everything. This is how I invested in this drink. <laughs> there you go. We'll yeah. give you. We'll, it, we'll, happened, it happened real time, live. <laughs> yes, we have a valuation. We have partners. We have... I Actually, uh, last weekend, I completed the Stanford Latino Entrepreneur sure. Program. David Favela did that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. he did. Yes. Which I just found out, you know, he, he sent me a message. He's like, oh, I'm class of 2020. And what they're doing is sort of like what we're doing with that program. They have 75 entrepreneurs twice a year. And that's, you know, their solution for growing the American economy by empowering Latino entrepreneurs. Because all these studies that have come out show that we are the spine of the economy <laughs> as entrepreneurs. So it's, a, it's a, an investment in the economy and i mean also the future looks to it i mean the median the average age of a latino right now is 11 years old oh. wow 11. that is a future of latino buying power that's just gonna very young grow. oh yeah yeah and that's also i think why we're like catching up in all these industries because we're so young as as a community but there's some studies that say in like 2050 one in five kids is gonna be a sure. latino kid what has been the hardest part when you go raise capital today? I think it's very similar to what's happening in in Hollywood. It's a, a cultural disconnect, like not understanding, like, well, we tried that before and it hasn't worked. You know, get to Latinos. I'm like, yeah, but who? You try it? You don't have the relationships that we have, right. you know? Like, right. It's also not you know? the understanding and the sensitivity mm -hmm. to it, you know. There's a huge disconnect. And even in the projects, people will throw projects our way. They're like, hey, well, there's this movie. And I'm like, well, there's a lot of just mismatch in the movie. And I'll give you like a quick example. They say, well, we tried this movie out and it didn't work out. It's like, they don't understand that we come from different countries. You'll see, there'll be scenes where there's, mm -hmm. you know, a mariachi playing and then, uh, you know, and then a matador will come out. It's like, wait, that's Spain yeah. and that's Mexico. Yeah. And then, you know, something, a gaucho, you know, yeah. comes in and starts <laughs> cutting meat. And it's like, y'all just kind of crossed yeah. over three different countries, don't understand, don't <laughs> really aren't understand why Latinos are getting behind it. the protagonist is from uh, Michigan. <laughs> like, yeah. why? <laughs> Yeah, with a Cuban speak, accent. Okay. Yeah, so, they would speak English, like uh, maybe a little funny. Spanish, you know, at home. But but let me tell you something. People do see the opportunity. So it's yeah. there because we're a huge buying power. It's just a matter of like educating. So in my head, I'm always like, okay, cool. How do you give people like cookie crumbs to to the big picture, right? And so, do you think it starts? Maybe you've already tried this, but do you think it starts small, where you're just kind of like. Hey, uh, like I can imagine maybe they're using a cooking show, let's say, and it's like, hey, why don't you use some quinoa, you know, or like, and they're like, oh, where's that from? I'm like, oh, don't, worry, don't worry about it. Just use the quinoa. And then, and then all of a sudden, like, no, where's it from? Oh, it's from Peru. And then it's like, oh, maybe we feature like a farmer from Peru. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's, but it's their idea. And so even with, um, if there's a show, you just kind of go like, oh, I don't, maybe like the coffee and they talk about the coffee in a way that's like from Cuba or something simple in that way that kind of gives them the idea that they can build over time of like, oh, maybe there's something here. Maybe there's a partnership collaboration that I had considered. Who's they? 
the makers of these things today. So like oh, the studio system, the studio system today. Oh no, no, yeah, yeah. there's <laughs> but it's, zero. It, no, the 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 instant response still goes back to what's been attempted and yeah. didn't work. Yeah, that's why a billion remakes. There's no original stories, but yeah. there is. There's a lot of talent in this town, in the whole country. There's there's a lot of talent. Well, I remember we were talking to H. My my wife was on HGTV on these on like a show, and they wanted us to do a show. My wife and I. And so as we're doing, because they wanted to get more diverse, yes. how funny. Yeah. And so, <laughs> as I'm talking to them about doing the show, which is like no money, by the way. I'm yeah. like, I make way more money doing what I do for a living. Why would I do your show? Yeah. yeah. And then we're going down this road and they're like, you guys sound too hip. And then I'm like, I sound too uh, hip. Yeah. And then they're the like, we don't like what you wear. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm wearing neutrals. Like, <laughs> like I am right now, as a matter of fact, like mm-hmm. this is not, this is a neutral thing. I don't understand why you, you think I'm like too hip with my clothing and then i i started that wonder and so i was like who's your viewer like what's your who's your viewer oh our viewer is 70 years old like sir can you be be less brown sir (laughs) yeah i'm like oh you're average okay and like middle america i imagine Hmm. and then if you watch the commercials in hgtv you actually pick this up because it's like life alert yeah adult diapers (laughs) a stair stair climber device yeah and then i'm like man how did a gay dude yeah right but then i realized what the networks are solving for is like they don't want to take any risks, zero risks. They just yeah. want the rinse and repeat of what's working. It's, we'll just do that. Yeah. And, because, and it's a know, bummer for creatives. But I get also, it. I get the yeah. CEO doesn't want to be fired. Mm-hmm. They don't want to, they're playing it safe. They don't want to be fired. You know, but there's an opportunity in that. Their return. For it's, any I, new network. I mean. Oh, absolutely. To own that what, One of our movies have, has to make to get on the green is so little compared to one of these Marvel movies. That's why they make a billion of them. And, you know, you're asking, oh, what if we start small? I've been, just to remind you, I've been advocating for 20 years. I started in a nonprofit where we advocated. That was the plan. Let's, you know, I would go to meetings with studios every year and they would give us the numbers. And every year our numbers go down. I don't know how, because they weren't even there to begin with. All we would ask is like, okay, can you cast two people, two Latinos at one of your shows? Well, you know, I'm like, you cannot even cast two of us? Two. If you look at the Emmys, the Emmy nominations, this is the first year 200 Latinos submitted to be considered because you have to submit. Only two Latinos got nominations. Two. Which two? What were the shows? It was Oscar Isaac and... uh, For Moon Knight? Domingo from... No, he got... No, from that other one. It's like the marriage, like he's married to uh, Chastain or whatever. Oh, oh uh, I can't remember the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm blanking. I'm yeah. A huge blank right and now. then yeah. um, Domingo, he's on Euphoria for like a guest star. Oh, okay, okay. He's amazing. Oh my God, he's amazing. But we had a lot of talent. So it's not for a lack of talent. Yeah. It's just the process of getting the nomination. The studio has to campaign for you. There's a lot of money involved in it. A lot of the 200 submissions were self-submissions. Right, actors who miraculously made into a show and they're like, okay, I'll just pay for it myself, but you know, you can't compete with. Right. So as it is, as, as the system is set up right now, it's very difficult to break it. This is why we're sort of building our own system. But what's happening is now some of the bigger players are coming to us like, oh, yeah. how'd you do that? So you have talent. So that is actually our goal is to grow and build a pipeline of so much talent that a major Hollywood studio or a company like Meta or somebody like that will have to will come in they and buy us, right? And then yeah. we'll be inside. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah we're going for acquisition at this point. The thing yeah. is, yeah. We're, by the time anyone gets to learn how to understand this, this company and this network we're building that we're going to release is just going to be have so much traction. Yeah, that it's just it's the quicker way to go. Yeah. Have you ever spoken to like the the, the founders of Univis- Univision? Yeah. And, or like Tyler Perry, even Tyler Perry is more in, in alignment with yeah. with what you're doing. Yeah, that's 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 ultimately what we're aspiring yeah. to do. We want to be him when we grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this man. He started. Have you guys talk, chatted with him at all? Not or? yet, but okay. we've talked to his former partners. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hmm. that is somebody we want to talk to. So if you're listening, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. but Perry. let me tell you, he's given to a couple of our crowdfunding campaigns. So that's really oh, that's exciting. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So with every other arm of, of your company that you've got, and w- going back to the award show problem, have you ever thought about creating your own award show? I mean, it seems <laughs> we, got, like- we, got, we get asked this often. Yeah, listen, it, it, yes, not something soon as immediately, but 
we've actually we've absolutely talked about it yeah. we've sort of like anything our clients tell us there's a need for we sort of like okay we'll do it too but you know the funding production and distribution arm of the company that's what every studio has we're not u- yeah. unique in that way except that we use unique ways to get those done I think for me, it'd be great to maybe partner up with like the Alma Awards who have been around for a long time or the Golden Eagle Awards who had a track record, but nobody would sponsor them and they're no longer in in the air. But maybe something that's already in existence, um, we would partner up and highlight the work. When you think about your entire journey, Mm -hmm. like what is what has been like if there's one story that just really captivates all of it or like the hardest part? where it was about to be over and then oh man how many times does that happen <laughs> as an, in a business in the life of an entrepreneur i mean you know what it is fanny and i have come across those situations at least half a dozen times when you're like what are we gonna do how are we gonna do this how do but we you, make payroll how do we make payroll it's happened in the past it's like how do we do this but we have a couple of key things integrity do work with integrity because people can sniff that a mile away if you do good work and you have integrity there are good people around here who will understand what you're going through and they will, you know, it'll come through. And, um, for us, it's just, there's just no other option. This isn't a side hustle. This isn't a hobby for us. This is more than just a business. This is a lifestyle. So one of the hardest parts I think I can share is that getting the attention of potential investors and partners, because those generally are outside of our community. So that has been the biggest challenge when we don't have as many at bats as anyone else. We have to be tighter and more spot on every time we go up to the plate. I I do think also like during the pandemic, it was very difficult for us because we weren't allowed to be at our space. We had a smaller space actually. And we tried doing the business, everybody from their home, you know, it just wasn't working out. It was very tough for us, but crowdfunding, it's online. So I figure out a way. Like we were like, we had no money in the bank. We're like, we're, we're going to close our doors. But we figure out, wait, crowdfunding's online. People are, we have a captive audience, right? They're so I called, <laughs> so we called all these clients that had paused their campaigns because they're like, I don't want to ask people for money during the freaking world pandemic. Yeah. But we figure out a way to still crowdfund successfully, not from ego, like, okay, how do you say that your project is actually gonna help this industry? Blah, blah. And you know, at the end of the day, crowdfunding is perfect because you're asking for five, ten dollars at a time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So they're not spending it at their local, you know, establishments exactly. in their neighborhood anymore. So mm-hmm. they have it. So mm-hmm. we pivoted and we figure out a way. And every single one of our campaigns was successful. Throughout the entire pandemic. The we're talking through March of wow. 2019. Wow. All the way yeah. through the years end. Every single campaign was successful. That's when we started to, building our... To move into our studio space during the project. We're, cra- <laughs> we're a little crazy, but you have to be, right? Perfect you have content. to. We just talked yeah. sometimes. We're like, <laughs> how, are we, how does this work out? We're like, well, there's no one to tell us no. And somehow that just works. Yeah. We just believe like, all right. It's <laughs> true. Let's jump and... God's got us, man. Like, we'll yeah. just figure it we got out. a lot of faith. We, we definitely have a, have a lot, lot of faith. faith. We're like, I feel like when you have integrity and you have good intentions and you have a good idea, like you just sometimes have to signal to the universe. All right, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> we, all hold each, we hold each other accountable a lot. Like we, yeah. we hold each other accountable like business partners. Mm-hmm. You know, we're married to each other, but if there's something that needs to get done or something that is is airing a little side on the gray area we're like no 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 let's let's get this right this is how we've always operated and we keep each other in check and at the end of the day it's it's almost clear as day on how important it was to to, to stay straight and keep that integrity yeah. i'm rooting for you guys i'm yeah. a big fan thank you thank, thank you guys, guys. Yeah. thank appreciate you both so yeah. much i appreciate it thanks for this water yeah, this is great <laughs> <laughs> hey you yeah you listening thank you so much for making it to the end of the episode Make sure to follow us on Instagram, subscribe on YouTube, and we cannot wait to see you next week for another great episode. Cheers.